Steven, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. I know you have your own your own channel. Tell me a little bit about your channel. Do you do a podcast and YouTube or just just YouTube? It's mostly YouTube. I was uploading a lot of them on the like podcast platforms as well, but I've gone fallen a bit behind. Most of my attention's been on YouTube. But yeah, it's called Mormonism with the Murph. I created it back in July 2022. So it's been just over a year and a half. And the purpose of the channel is to try to dive into controversial church history topics or look at things to do with the church's truth claims. So I've explored topics with church history or like the Book of Mormon. Uh, I want to try to be balanced and as fair and as objective as I can be while acknowledging that I'm biased, I'm a believer, and we all interpret things differently. But I really want to explore and to represent and steel man the critics' position and their, their criticisms, their arguments. Let's look at their evidence and then look at the faithful apologetic responses for some of the evidence in favor. And I also would interview different scholars or historians on a topic and I try to ask the hard questions. So that's kind of what my channel's about. I've also interviewed a few people about their faith journeys, uh, but for the most part, I'm focused on church truth claims and church history. So how did you get into this? What sparked such a passion for you getting into this? Uh, well, I would say probably my own faith journey, my own faith crisis is probably what caused me to be interested in things to do with church history and criticisms and apologetics. And we'll probably get into this with my story, but leaving the church, sort of losing my faith, and then having experiences that brought me back, and then sort of like trying to navigate and like reconstruct, okay, uh, now that I believe again, how do I make sense of some of these criticisms or attacks against the church's truth claims, and really just trying to dive in and front and figure out some sort of alignment between spiritual and intellectual. So it's not that much of a devotional sort of channel, um, it's it's more sort of a scholarly sort of channel research. Uh, if you're into it, then you'll enjoy it. I really enjoy Don Bradley, and I know a lot of our listeners do too. And I think that he he does such a great job of taking hard questions. And well, I mean, and he had his own faith journey, of course. But the way that he, I'm, I'm hoping to do an interview with John because, or with Don, sorry, because I he's a great historian, and I feel like. There's some connections with yeah. our faith journey. So I'm hoping to do an interview with him. I love how he responds to hard questions. It's like, it's almost like he like solved a puzzle and it was like this spiritual overflow once the puzzle was solved. And I don't know, it was just really, really interesting. Well, okay, let's jump into your story. I want to hear it. I know I've like heard bits and pieces, but I'm super excited to hear the whole story. And yeah, so let's, let's get started. So um, I'm from Northern Ireland, if uh, people can tell my accent's a bit peculiar. It's not the typical Irish accent that you associate with uh, leprechauns or people from Dublin. I, I think it always sounds a little bit more Scottish than your typical Irish accent. Uh, but I was born in Belfast. Uh, both my parents were members of the church. My dad was a convert. So he converted in his early 20s. He grew up in the Presbyterian faith. So he was a Christian, but I don't think he really had any faith. He had a friend who uh, invited him to take the missionary lessons and to read the Book of Mormon and felt the spirit, got baptized, then went on a mission. Uh, he met my mom after his mission, and she also was very active in the church. She served in calling. She went on a mission. So I had a pretty like traditional, maybe orthodox upbringing in the church. We would have went to church on Sundays, would have went to you know youth activities and primary. We would have had family home evening and daily family prayer we weren't great when it came to like daily scripture study and family home evening it was a bit like up and down but yeah I had a pretty regular upbringing so I would have went to young men's I was baptized at eight I was ordained a deacon teacher priest I wouldn't say I had a testimony as a child like you know there's some primary children that from age six they're up and they're like I know the church is true and I know Heavenly Father loves me and I love my family and they're like we goody to, to show you like Nephi's I was never like that. I was always like a little bit rebellious as a kid and I found church boring. Uh, I just didn't really understand the scriptures and I just couldn't wait to get home and play my PlayStation or play with the ball. So I wasn't very spiritually minded as a kid. I did have like a few experiences with like 
Heavenly Father, like, answering my prayer if I, like, lost my toy ball or couldn't find, uh, like, a toy or, like, my homework once I remember praying. But it was whenever I hit around the age of 12, 13, 14, I was going through personal sort of trial in my life. We just moved back. We were living in England for part of my childhood. And we moved back to Northern Ireland to move back to be with family. And I just moved into a new sort of secondary school. And whenever you hit like your teenage years, you know, you get self-conscious, you're going through puberty, all those things. Um, and I was having a really hard time fitting in with uh, the kids at my school, which I'd never struggled with before growing up. I always felt like I was quite a friendly kid and got along with people. But long story short, I, I went through a time of being bullied and it got quite severe to one point where I was really having a lot of emotional challenges, anxiety, fear. And it was around this time where I sort of turned to God and was like, why am I going through this? Like, why is this happening to me? Like, I'm a good kid. If I'm your child, like, please take this away. And it was around that time where the, the missionaries were taking me for young men's. I was the only young man at the time I wore uh, the church isn't very big <laughs> in Northern Ireland. Up until this point, I was not really interested in the gospel. But they gave me a Preach My Gospel, which is the missionary manual for how to be a missionary. And there's a chapter about basically what missionaries teach people who are learning about the gospel. So I studied about the message of the restoration, like the apostasy, Jewish Smith's first vision, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. I studied about the plan of salvation and the atonement of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was like I was learning about the gospel for the first time. Like, that's kind of how it felt. Like, I was an investigator. And it all just resonated in my mind. It all felt right in my heart. And my seed of faith was growing. And this was like a really dark and lonely time in my life. And it was like turning to the gospel and to the scriptures. was bringing like this light. And I felt like a stronger connection to Heavenly Father and, and Jesus Christ. So over time, like, I was believing what I was studying, I, I read like the Gospel Principles Manual and I was reading through other manuals and I hadn't read through the whole Book of Mormon, but I read enough scripture passages where I was like, I believe this, but I wanted to do Moronite's Promise to receive that spiritual witness from the Holy Ghost. So one night I remember just kneeling down and praying and asking, you know, if I'm a child of God, if Jesus Christ is my savior, if Joseph Smith really was a prophet, uh, if the Book of Mormon and the plan of salvation is true, and I remember after saying that prayer, experiencing what people describe as the burning in the bosom. I, I experienced that, this warm, overwhelming feeling in my heart of just joy and love and just this assurance. I felt like this assurance that these things are true, that I'm a child of God, that Heavenly Father has a plan for me, that Joe Smith was a prophet, scriptures are his words. And, and I recognize that I had been feeling the spirit the whole time. But that was, this was the first time that I really recognized it. So that was my testimony. So I felt like I, I had a strong testimony as like a 14 year old youth. And I would have went to like temple trips and EFYs and went to seminary and felt like I also saw answers to prayer and, and little miracles in my life that sort of confirmed that the church was true and that God lived. I went on a mission whenever I was 19. So I went to uh, Alberta, Canada. Um, the Canada Calgary mission, which was again an amazing experience. Uh, I had a lot of cold feet prior to going on a mission because I was quite shy and had anxiety. I was really fearful about like going to a foreign country for two years and talking to strangers, you know, about the gospel and the church and being with a companion you don't know and being away from like friends, family. Like when the mission call came, I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, I'm actually sacrificing a lot <laughs> to go on a mission. And the thought of it was like, this sounds pretty horrible, like knocking doors and talking to people on the streets. I'm like, I don't want to do this. But I absolutely love my mission. Uh, Canada was a great place. Like, sure, there's challenges, like there's a lot of rejection and it's hard work, a mission, but it was so rewarding and joyful. And you made so many amazing relationships with people, missionaries you serve with, they're members in your wards, and some of the people that you taught the gospel to as well. So many amazing experiences. And I felt that I really did see miracles on my mission. I felt like I witnessed being like an instrument in God's hands. There were times where I, I really felt like the Spirit was helping me and inspiring me. And felt like my, my testimony, my love of the scriptures grew and just my conversion to 
Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. And by the end of my mission, I felt like I absolutely knew it was true. I was 100% sure this is the Lord's church. Joseph Smith is a prophet and just had no doubts at all. That's amazing. I love that so much. It's I love how you get your call and you're like, oh, crap, what did I just sign myself up for? <laughs> oh, it, it was like a flood of anxiety because um, cause the mission call or the mission age just uh, changed from 19 to 18, I think like mm-hmm. a year prior. End up there was some delay, so it didn't end up going until I was 19. But it was whenever I got the call, I remember that day, like everyone has the, these big celebrations, mm-hmm. like parties when they get the mission call. I can remember going in my back garden and just feeling pure <laughs> panic. And then I kind of was in denial up until I got sat apart. And then again, it was like pure panic. <laughs> I was just like, what on earth am I doing? And all, all the people around me who had mission calls, they were just so excited. And they're just like, a mission's going to be awesome. And I'm just like, have, have you thought this through? Like, we can't watch movies, listen to like normal music. We have to talk to strangers. Like, there could be crazy people. In some ways, I had very idealistic expectations of a mission. But it was more joyful and rewarding than I could have anticipated. I love that so much. That's so cool. And it sounds like it was really, it really cemented your testimony after the younger years of discovering and having that, that spiritual confirmation. And then it sounds like it solidified it. And then what happened after that? Yeah. So, well, I came home and testimony was strong. I was serving in callings. Uh, I was going out regularly with the missionaries. So you could say I had like the RM fire. And what sort of led me to having a faith crisis was I had a family member who no longer believed. She'd uh, stopped going to the church. I I wouldn't say she was like a hostile, angry anti-Mormon, but she was pretty against the church. And a few months after I mission, uh, my mom passed away, which was obviously a really sad and devastating and tragic time. It was a really sacred time in my life where I felt like I really cleaved and turned to the gospel and the plan of salvation even more. And it really brought us together as a family. When something like that happens, you realize that like family relationships are what matter most. And all of the other mundane things in life are of secondary importance. Um, and I was really thinking about our eternal family. And I wanted to help my sister who had lost her faith to come back to the church. And she was still a really good person. We had a good relationship. And I wanted to know her concerns because in order to help resolve her concerns, I had to sort of know what they were. And up until this point, I'd never gone looking for anti-Mormon or critical material. I knew like a few things. So I knew about like the priesthood ban um, that blacks weren't given the priesthood until 1978. I knew about polygamy. I I don't know if I knew that Joseph practiced polygamy. If if I did know that, I we would just assume they're all like spiritual wives or just ceilings. I remember I watched the movie God's Army, which is like a really, it's a class missionary movie. And there's a missionary who sort of uh, doubts his testimony and like leaves on uh, in the movie. And he brings up like, oh, well, there are no horses in America till Columbus came or there's multiple accounts of the first vision. So I maybe had heard of a few things, but I really didn't know any of the criticisms in church history. So she started sharing with me some of her concerns. And some of them now are like things which maybe wouldn't bother me a whole lot where there's, I understand the context to them. But she, I remember, told me like, you know, Joe Smith drank wine in Carthage jail or that Joseph Smith had a seer stone or Joseph Smith married a 14 year old or other men's wives. And I'd never heard of that before. And immediately my response was, that's anti-Mormon lies. Like, where are you getting this information from? And then she showed me some sources like in the history of the church or the journal of discourses were things in the church's gospel topics essay. And I was like, huh, okay, like some of this is right. And then I was like, okay, well, I wanna I want to hear it all. Like, bring it on. I want to go down the deep dive. And the main critics that influenced her losing her faith was uh, a man called Grant Palmer. He was a former institute teacher and director and a church historian who was excommunicated from the church. And the Tanner, so Sandra Tanner, she's quite famous for uh, Utah Lighthouse Ministry. And they have a book, Mormonism, Shadow of Reality. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to listen to every single episode and interview I could find of them. And I was working night shift at the time. So I was working in a supermarket and you could put your earphones in. So I was just listening to tons of interviews and podcasts. And during this time, I was just being 
exposed to so many criticisms and challenges against the church, its truth claims, against the Book of Mormon, against the Prophet Joseph Smith. But I think what was really troubling is I was learning some things which, which were true, and I didn't know how to reconcile. And over the period of a couple of months, I was just sort of like in faith crisis, where I was just struggling with just so many issues, things from like the different accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision, anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, or DNA in the Book of Mormon, 19th century material or the King James Bible passages or errors, polygamy, Abraham, uh, the connections between the Temple Endowment and Freemasonry, that Joseph was a Freemason, May 1842, and then about six weeks later, we got the Temple Endowment changes to Revelations and uh, Adam God theory and Blood Atonement and some of the racial teachings justifying the priesthood ban. And it was like within a couple of months, I was like being exposed to like so many issues and challenges. Uh, I was really doubting my testimony. I remember I had a couple of meetings with uh, a priesthood leader, with my state president, and I was going for a Temple Recommend interview. And when he asked me a question, I can't remember what it is, but sort of like if you have a testimony of like the restoration of the Prophet Joseph Smith, I just couldn't answer yes. And he was quite surprised. So then I started to tell him some of my questions and concerns. And he was quite informed. He was quite nuanced. So he sort of validated and empathized with some of the questions. We had a, a couple of follow-up meetings and he was trying to provide a sort of like a faithful interpretation and he encouraged me to check out Fire Mormon. So I was like, okay, I'll go check out Fire Mormon. In our conversations, I was becoming more critical because really 90% of what I was consuming was critical material. I read through a lot of Mormon think. I then ordered Grant Palmer's book and I was just fully immersed in, in the criticisms. And it, it came to the point where I had spiritual experiences. But I, I interpreted that my spiritual experiences were emotional feelings based upon being taught just a faith-promoting, whitewashed version of the history. But now I was exposed to sort of like the good, the bad, and the ugly. I no longer felt the same and interpreted that my spiritual experiences weren't a reliable way to, to know truth as many sort of ex-Mormons come to that conclusion. And I just came to the conclusion one day that I no longer believe Joe Smith is prophet. I was really troubled by things with polygamy. I no longer believed that this was the true church or the Book of Mormon was the word of God. I, I was very convinced by the naturalistic explanations for the Book of Mormon. And I think I had this view of like scripture and prophets, like a prophet can never be wrong about a doctrine. Like everything a prophet speaks at the pulpit is like the mind and will of God. So I couldn't reconcile things which appear to be wrong in past teachings or like I had a very literal view of scripture that Scripture is literally God speaking. And then learning about some of the changes made uh, to some of the additions in the Book of Mormon or Revelations, I just couldn't couldn't reconcile it. During so, this time, were you kind of like going back and forth with your sister about it? Because she's kind of the one that, were you guys just kind of... Yeah, we, we would have talked about it. We would have talked about the criticisms and the problems and almost like just reinforcing like, there's no way that this can be true. There's There's too many mm -hmm. issues. I do want to say that I can't blame her for it because she she did say to me, I'm not trying to pull you away from the church, but read this for yourself. Mm -hmm. So it was very much myself that came to the conclusion. So I remember I, I was serving as a young men's president, but I remember just one day being like, yeah, I, d I don't believe this anymore. And with integrity, like I was in the church because I was, I was a believer. Like I really believed it was true. And I think I was so 100% all or nothing, black or white, that I was just like, Joe Smith's a fraud, con man, sexual predator, prophets and apostles are frauds. The church is just a multi-billion corporation and just didn't believe in it anymore. So I wrote a letter to my bishop and I sort of had really positive things to say about my upbringing and experiences in the church. Like I, the church was a wonderful experience. My mission was a great experience. So I didn't have really any negatives in that sense, but I, I laid out in bullet points, these are sort of my issues and concerns, and this is why I no longer believe. Ironically, I hadn't actually read the CS letter at this point, but I read it after I left. But me and, and Jeremy Runnels had read and researched a lot of the same stuff, because uh, a lot of what's in the CS letter is taken from Mormon Thing or Grant Palmer's book or the Tanners. So whenever I read the CS letter, it was really like validating. I was like, yeah, I'm like, I'm with you, Jeremy. Like I have the same questions and issues as him. So yeah, I I wrote that letter 
that I was going to leave the church. I didn't remove my name. Uh, my dad didn't want me to. But for all intents and purposes, I was out. And it was quite uh, quite liberating. What did you do when you left? Were you like, I'm going to try some alcohol? Like, what What was well, the first thing you did? Like, did you... Is that kind of what you thought? Like, I'm... Whenever I left, so I I still believed in God. I still believed in Jesus. And a lot of the critics I was really influenced by were tend to be evangelical Christian critics. So Sandra Tanner and Grant Palmer uh, were Christian. I was listening to like uh, the Wilders who left Mormonism and converted to Christianity. I, I read her book. I was reading a lot of and listening to a lot of like Christian channels, but they were attacking Mormonism. So I still felt like I don't need to throw out God or Jesus. I still believe I had like maybe some spiritual experiences or answers to prayer. But all this Joseph Smith Book of Mormon, that's all malarkey. That's all not true. So for a time, I was going to Christian churches. I was reading the Bible and I was really wanting to embrace Christianity. I did obviously start drinking tea and coffee. And yes, I did have alcohol and so over the next few months, I was I was going to Christian churches and I really wanted to be a Christian. And even though I was quite skeptical of spiritual experiences, I was open to having a conversion experience in Christianity. And I was dating a Christian girl, um, but I never had a spiritual experience that I felt like this is this is the truth. This is where God wants me to be. And over time, as I was researching, I became disillusioned with some Christian beliefs or doctrines, particularly the Trinity. I read a book about the Trinity, so I realized I actually understand it as a Latter-day Saint. But to me, it just seemed like a man-made doctrine that they were trying to harmonize the Bible, because to a lot of Christians, the Bible is inerrant, infallible, and there can't be any contradictions. So in Isaiah, when he talks about that there's one God, but then Jesus is referred to as God, the Father is referred to as God, but the Holy Spirit is, off, is referred to as God. Well, there can't be three gods, so it's one god, three persons. And I just never would have got that from reading the New Testament. I remember having a meeting with the minister and sort of challenging him with some scriptures where I was like, this really seems like the Father and the Son are you know, distinct and separate, and I just do not read the Trinity. I think heaven and hell doctrine I struggled with. I had a friend who asked me, like, okay, you're a Christian now. I was like, yeah. And it was like, what about all those people who don't believe in God or in Jesus? Do they just go to an eternal hell of like torment and suffering? I remember at the time just being like, oh, and I kind of like brought in my Mormonism. I was like, you know, I was like, maybe in the next life, God will give them an opportunity to hear and accept. Or maybe he won't send them to like an eternal hell. That seems like really harsh, like suffering and torment just because you didn't believe in Jesus, but you're still a really good person. I remember thinking like, you know what? I, I don't like Joseph Smith. I don't believe in it. But I was like, being taught the gospel in the spirit world or the kingdoms of glory. There was a video that Saints Unscripted posted just recently. And we had David Alexander on the podcast last week. And he was talking about the same thing, the the heaven and hell and how it's just so you're either going one place or the other. And it, yeah, it's so extreme. And I think something that, that also I felt very disillusioned by was because whenever I was, you know, 14 and I had my spiritual experiences, I felt like I really came to know the Savior. I felt like I really experienced his love, his grace, his peace during that trial in my life. Like if I ever felt close and connected to Christ, it was during that time. And when Christians would say that Mormons were following the wrong Jesus, it's a different Jesus, it's a false gospel. I heard like some pastors or Christian apologists say that Mormons are going to hell. I just knew that wasn't mm -hmm. true. I, I knew that I experienced the real Jesus in the church. And also my mom had just passed away a few months earlier. And my mom was just pure saint. Like she was faithful to the end. If there was an afterlife, I felt completely sure and confident. She's in heaven. Yeah. Like I, I have no doubt about that. And I, I was attending a Presbyterian church. Uh, not all Christians believe this, so I, I don't want to misrepresent. But those who are sort of Calvinists, believe that God is already predestined or pre-chosen, sort of who's saved and who's not saved. And I remember at the time, that just really troubled me. I just couldn't accept that God has predestined some people to just suffer in eternal hell. So I began to become disillusioned with Christianity. And as I was researching a little bit more about the Bible, 
I realized that a lot of Christians who attack Mormonism have like a double standard. They don't apply the same scrutiny to the Bible. Uh, I've got a good friend, Steve Pinecker, who you should probably have on, although he's not a member of the church. He lost his faith, went atheist, returned back to the church, but he's really friendly to members of the church. And what I like about him is he does apply the same scrutiny to the Bible, uh, which a lot of Christians don't. Christians will often say like there's no archaeological evidence for the Book of Mormon. And there's so many like anachronisms and things. But in the Bible, there's no evidence outside the Bible that there was a historical Moses or Abraham or that there was an Exodus. There's no evidence for a global flood or a Tower of Babel. And then whenever I was looking at biblical scholars, they talked about how there's two different creation accounts in the book of Genesis or two different flood accounts. You know, there's genocide in the Old Testament. I was like, you know, polygamy bothers me, but genocide, like killing men, women, and children in the name of God. Like, I was like, that's pretty horrific. And then whenever I was looking at the Gospels, like there's differences between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you look at some of Jesus' teachings or like uh, what it says in Jesus' cross or who appears at the tomb and his resurrection. So if you're going to be really critical of like, say, the differences in Joseph Smith's first vision, it's like, I feel like you have to be consistent. There's There's differences if you look at the gospel mm -hmm. accounts right? Or Judas dies two different ways. I remember I was trying to harmonize like James and Paul, like saved by grace alone through faith. But then what about all these scriptures talking about works? So I was, I was starting to become disillusioned with the Bible. Critics would say that the witnesses of the gold plates, they're not credible. They had a visionary mindset, a magical worldview. But then I was like, why are the witnesses of Christ's resurrection any more credible? How can I say that okay, there's differences in Joe Smith's first vision, so I can throw that out, but there's differences in Paul's accounting of his vision on the road to Damascus. And I began to realize that if I'm applying the same consistency uh, to the Bible, that there's some issues there as well. And it was during this time where I was almost like, well, I don't know what I believe. I don't know if there's a Jesus. I don't know if there's a God. And this is when I think I was really in faith crisis, like the dark night of the soul, because I think when I first left the church, Christianity was a soft mm -hmm. landing. And I kind of felt liberated, but I also felt like, okay, this is what I believe now. But now I was like, I don't know what I believe. Like, am I going to be agnostic? Am I going to be atheist? Is there still a Jesus, but all religions are wrong? I was just really torn at mm -hmm. this time. Wow. I imagine that being in that place was probably extremely depressing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I was heavily conflicted and what happened around the same time which sort of added to the feeling conflicted because I felt like 99% true church wasn't what it claimed to be and I, I was very well well versed in a lot of the critical arguments I pretty much memorized the CS letter so whenever I get into discussions with people about the church I would just bring up all the problems all the criticisms and I felt like I would win in these intellectual debates with people but I remember I had I had a friend who before a mission had a near death experience. He he almost died. He had a severe asthma attack and the doctors didn't believe he was gonna live. And I remember fasting and praying for him and he received numerous priesthood blessings. And I actually did an interview with him on my channel, uh, with Adam McElrath, so people can check it out, um, where we go in more depth. But the doctors didn't believe he was gonna live, but miraculously he did. And Adam claimed to have an afterlife experience. And during this time, because I was investing in Christianity, I was also listening to like, like loads of afterlife experiences. And some of them seemed like really like inspiring and touching and others were quite like weird. But I wanted to know about his afterlife experience. He claimed to, to meet Jesus. Um, he claimed that he was engaged in missionary work on the other side. And his experience, if it didn't confirm the church, it at least showed that Jesus approved of the church if what he was saying really happened. And I sincerely believe he believes it. And I didn't know what to do with that at the time because I was so dog certain Joe Smith was a false prophet, the church is a cult. I didn't know what to do with that. And that was probably the first time where I felt a little bit of like uncertainty or like maybe my 99% certainty the church wasn't what it claims to be dropped like maybe like a 90 but I was also like, you know, loads of people claim afterlife visionary experiences. There's no way I can know it really happened. I remember my dad, he, he sent me a, an apologetic video. 
And initially I was like, dad, like, I don't want to listen to this pseudo scholarship, this mental gymnastics. Church isn't what it claims to be. Like, come on, like, give it a rest. And he was like, just watch it. And I sort of recognized that I'm not being very open-minded. I'm not willing to listen. I had already come to a firm conclusion. So I was like, fine, I'll watch it. Uh, it was by a guy called Bruce Porter. And it was about the connections and correspondences and parallels between our temple endowment and the ancient Egyptian temple rituals. If I'm being intellectually honest and consistent, just as I couldn't deny that there are things which are similar, if not identical, between a Masonic ritual and temple endowment, there were things which corresponded quite well. And I was like, okay, I can understand why to a believer, they might think that the temple endowment is like a, a restoration of like an ancient temple ritual. That sort of sparked some curiosity. So then I started to explore, like, is there any other evidence on this? Because I never heard this before. And I watched uh, some videos on Farrah Mormon, and there's a really good uh, YouTube channel, LDS Truth Claims, talking about the correspondences and connections between ancient temple rites and our temple endowment of ancient Jewish priests or early Christians, or even like the ceremony of a monarch uh, as well, like a king or a queen being coronated, and how they you know, would receive like a garment with marks in it or robes, make certain covenants. Early Christians did like prayer circles, uh, some of the hand clasps and things. And I was seeing like a lot of these striking correspondences to our temple endowment. The conclusion that Joseph Smith just plagiarized and took everything from masonry, this now complicates that interpretation. I still thought, okay, he maybe just took it from masonry. But I realized a believing argument could be made that perhaps masonry was a catalyst for restoring ancient temple rites. And that was kind of cool at the time, kind of opened my mind, didn't cause me to believe. But then I started going down sort of like the rabbit hole of what other faithful evidence is there. So I looked at, you know, Nahum and Bountiful, uh, Lehi's travel through the Arabian desert and how it converges really well with the text of First Nephi. They found Nahum, an altar, NHM, it's in sort of like the right location, dated at the right time, near a burial site. And then the eastward turn that's spoken about in First Nephi to Bountiful, they found a really good candidate for Bountiful there, Kor Karfot. And Nahum's kind of like scoffed by critics, like, oh, just NHM and an altar. But whenever I really looked at the whole travel and how it converged really well, I thought to myself, like, man, if Joseph Smith just made this up, how does it actually converge this well? And I was, I was adamant he must have had a map. Like th that's the only way I could explain it. Uh, I couldn't find really any solid evidence for that. So that was sort of like a book on like my unbelieving shelf, where I was like, "Wow, oh, this actually correlates really well." Whenever I looked at the witnesses of the gold plates, critics tend to focus on like a lot of like second, third hand statements, where like Martin Harris says, "Like, oh, I saw them with spiritual eyes," or "I saw Jesus in the form of a deer." You know, I didn't really see the plates. I only saw the plates like I see a city through a mountain. And if you just look at those quotes, you're like, oh, these guys are incredible. They had a visionary mindset and a magical worldview. They're a bunch of loons and you can't take their testimony seriously. But as I was researching into the, the accounts of the witnesses of the gold plates, the critics were only presenting a few and second, third hand statements of the witnesses and were omitting about 90% of their positive wow. statements where the three witnesses throughout their life reaffirm, not only do they never deny their testimony, but even after leaving, they reaffirm over and over again. They know they saw the angel. They know they saw the plates. David Whitmer was once asked, are you sure it wasn't a hallucination or a mental disturbance? He's like, no. He's like, I saw with my eyes. I heard with my ears. I know where wow. I speak. And even Martin Harris, the one who they say like, oh, he was a, you know, a spiritual loon. So many times he would say, like, as sure as you see the sun in the sky, I saw the plates. And as sure as you see that chopping block, I saw the angel in the plates and I chopped my head off before I deny it. And I was reading so many statements from the three witnesses and the eight witnesses. And I was like, OK, it's faith whether or not we believe their testimonies. But they are absolutely adamant that they know they saw the angel in the plates. And I think I began to realize that, like, you know, the, the critical view that Joe Smith just manufactured or fashioned his own set of metal plates he somehow tricked the eight witnesses when he showed it to them and then the three witnesses all had a mass hallucination and the book of mormon prophesied that the three witnesses would see the plates by the power of god and that was before the witnesses saw the angel in the plates i was like that's also like pretty 
unbelievable for Joseph to pull off. Like, that's almost as hard to believe as there really being an angel in place. Maybe they told the truth. And we're looking into, also into the Book of Bina, which is in the Book of Moses. And there's, like, correspondences in, like, themes, motifs be uh, between Joseph's Book of Enoch and some ancient documents of the Book of Enoch, particularly the Book of Giants and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I just didn't know how to make sense of. As Joseph Smith is a fraud, how is how there's so many correspondences because he wouldn't have had access? And I remember a, a scholar, Harold Bloom, unbelieving scholar, said that well, Joseph's a religious genius, you know. So it was, it was at this time where I was also encountering some things in support of the church, which was causing some cognitive dissonance for me being absolutely sure that Joseph Smith was a false prophet. He made up the Book of Mormon. So it was around this time where I was very conflicted and I didn't really know where I was going to go. And what was sort of the catalyst for me going back to the church? Because I don't think any of those intellectual arguments or evidence would have caused my faith to come back. They were kind of interesting, but I was still just like, no, I don't believe it's true. And somebody sent me a talk. It was BYU Devotional by Elder. Oh, Kovach. yeah, the Stand Forever Stand talk. Forever. Yeah. And I listened to it. And I remember I listened to it like three times in a row. And his talk in a nutshell, he talked about how a lot of people are leaving the church or experiencing doubts, uh, encountering criticisms leveled against the church. And he talked about he himself as a general authority wading through a lot of like antagonistic material and feeling like this spiritual gloom as he was wading through it. And a critic would say, well, you're feeling gloomy because your religion's being shown to be false. That's why you're feeling gloomy and all this cognitive dissonance. But remember he said that the spiritual gloom he felt, it was the absence of the spirits and that God's voice isn't in those critical voices. And he talked about how there's primary questions and there's secondary questions. And the primary questions are of what are of most importance. Like, is there a God? Is Jesus Christ our savior? Was Joseph Smith the prophet? Is the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints the Lord's restored church? Is the Book of Mormon true? And I don't think he was trying to be dismissive of the secondary questions because they're still important. But I felt like he was making the argument that you could spend a lifetime going through all the secondary questions. And even if you find answers to the secondary questions, it still doesn't answer the primary questions. So for example, on my channel, I did a series on Joe Smith's first vision, responding to a lot of the criticisms leveled against his first vision. And I feel like I've provided some plausible answers, you know, responding to some of the criticisms. Some people may not be persuaded, but even if you feel like they answer a lot of the criticisms, it still doesn't really prove or determine whether or not Joe Smith had his yeah. first vision or not. And I felt like that was the point of his talk. And he talked about like there's different ways of knowing truth. There's like a research, analytical method, scientific method, and then like a divine spiritual method. So the power of his talk that really profoundly hit me, that touched my heart, was he he held up the scriptures and he just fully and very sincerely said, like, ask yourselves, ask God, are these lies, are they delusion, or are they truth? That was sort of my my James one five. Although I was wrestling with lots of doubts and concerns about the Bible, still things to do with the church, even questioning God or Jesus, deep, deep down, I still believed there was a God who'd answered my prayers. And I sort of had this, this moment where, like, if I believe that there's a God, I have to believe he's going to speak to me. He's almost not worth believing in if I don't believe he can answer me. And sometimes credit, uh, Christians will say, like, don't pray about the Book of Mormon. That's how you get deceived, you know men's hearts are deceitful i sort of feel like is god like so weak that asking faith that he can't answer you and i feel like when you look at some of the simple teachings of jesus in the new testament it's like asking you shall receive seeking you shall find knocking it shall be opened unto you so i decided that i'm gonna fast and pray it was a time of uh sincere prayer uh urgent seeking probably the most humble heartfelt prayer of real intent i was fasting just pouring out all my concerns all my questions real issues and doubts i had uh, what is what's true what's the right path um should i be a christian are all religions wrong but maybe there's still a jesus is the church of jesus christ already saints is it the true church just do some of the prophet are the scriptures your words what must i do to be on the right path and return back to live with you i remember after saying some prayers no answer came I remember I had an impression, and I would have said to people as a missionary, if you want to talk to God, pray. 
but if you want God to talk to you, turn to the scriptures. And I, I'd thrown away all my Mormonism stuff into a cupboard. I threw all my garments in the, <laughs> a rubbish bag and my scriptures were away in a drawer, like my Book of Mormon Doctrine and Covenants. But I, I went and opened the Doctrine and Covenants and I opened to section 18. I said, I'll just read a couple of the verses that I read. So this is verse 33, and it says, I, Jesus Christ, your Lord and your God, have spoken it. These words are not of men, nor of man, but of me. Wherefore, you shall testify they are of me, and not of man. For it is my voice which speaketh them unto you, for they are given by my spirit unto you. And by my power, you can read them unto another. See, if it were by my power, you could not have them. Wherefore, you can testify you have heard my voice and know my words. Oh. And as I read that passage, and I'm sure I've read it before, I just felt filled with illumination and enlightenment in my mind and just this joy and this love and this light in my soul. Um, I was just overfilled and tears streamed down. And it was as if it was like the veil was rent and it was the Lord speaking directly to me uh, that these are his words that he spoke to me by his spirit. I've heard his voice. And it was probably one of the most powerful spiritual experiences I've ever had, but it was also not too different to other spiritual experiences. It just seemed more direct, more profound. And for ours, I just lay there feeling just filled and illuminated and enlightened. So then as the spiritual feelings sort of fade away, remember I was still sort of a skeptic and unbeliever. And I thought, hold on a minute. I was like, maybe I just like was in a very emotional state praying open the scriptures, happen to read that passage, and then experience like elevation emotion or brain euphoria. Like it wasn't really God speaking. But at the same time, it did feel like pretty like profound, powerful experience. And I didn't want to deny it if it was really God speaking to me. So I was kind of like wrestling and going back and forth and second guessing. So I was praying again. I was like, Heavenly Father, I've had this experience. Like if it was you speaking to me, if it was the Holy Ghost, like if this was a revelation you telling me that these are your words. I don't want to deny it, but I, I really need to know. I don't want to be misled. I really need to know if this was spirit and uh, revelation that I experienced or just my own emotions. So I was praying for guidance, praying for confirmation. And the next day I turned to section six of the Doctrine and Covenants, which was a revelation given by Joseph Smith to Oliver Cowdery from the Lord. Um, I think I can recite this passage. The Lord says, Blessed art thou for what thou hast done, for thou hast inquired of me. And as often as thou hast inquired, thou hast received instruction of my spirit. If it had not been so, you would not be at the place where you are at this time. So I knowest thou hast inquired of me, and I did enlighten thy mind. And I tell thee these things that thou mayest know. Thou hast been enlightened by the spirit of truth. And then later he goes on to say, uh, Did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness can you have than from God? And when I read these words, I was just kind of like mind blown. It was the same enlightenment and illumination in my mind and this joy and love in my, my heart and my soul. There were no tears, but it just it felt so direct. Like it was God confirming that I had received revelation. You know that you've inquired of me. You have been enlightened by the spirit of truth. What greater witness can you have than from God? And I felt like that was God confirming the revelation. But unfortunately, because <laughs> I'm a doubter and a skeptic, same process happened a few hours later. I was still like, was this just a coincidence again? I remember I read, but I went back and I read the CS letter again. And then I went back to God and I was like, no, nah, there's too many issues. Like, look at Adam God theory, God. Look at polyandry. Look at the serious doing in a hat. I was like, there's too many issues. There's no way it can be true. I was like, there's some disconnect here. Like, is this Satan giving me the revelation? I was like, okay, well, I don't think that really makes sense. And I was just like, how can it be true? And I also felt annoyed that I got that answer because I didn't want the implications of like going back to church again. Like I made it very public. I no longer believe. I made a public post. I wrote a letter to my bishop. I'm enjoying drinking tea and coffee and not having to pay tithing. And I was like, I don't want to have to go back to my war. Like it's full of crazy people. And I was just like the implications. I'm like, I'm annoyed that I've had this answer. And I was like, you must be misinformed. There's so many problems, God. I know you claim to know everything, but you obviously don't know about CS. Like. <laughs> the next day I was flicking through the Book of Mormon. And I find this quite funny. I read Jacob 4, 
And there is a scripture, and I'll just paraphrase, but it's along the lines of like, don't seek to counsel the Lord, but seek counsel from his hands, for he counsels in justice and wisdom over all his works. And, you know, pretty much uh, God knows everything. And then there is a part that said, uh, despise not the revelations of God. Wow. And I was just like, oh, for sake. I was you like, for can't sake, deny God, after those three experiences. <laughs> I was like, you just want me to believe and just take your word on it. And then after that, for a week, I I just shut it off. I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not accepting this revelation mumbo jumbo. I was like, if you want me to believe, send the angel, send the plates. I want proof. Um, I just shut it off. I remember I went to a wedding and just got absolutely drunk and hammered. I was just trying to like forget these things happened. And over that next week, how I would describe how I felt was like a state left onto myself. I felt just this like manna was coming from heaven, like that strong connection to God. And then when I sort of like rejected and I was hardening my heart, I just felt completely left onto my own. After a week, realized I probably should be demanding a sign. I was reading the scriptures again and the scriptures talk about like you, you shouldn't demand a sign for faith. I remember reading the Doctrine and Covenants that signs don't produce faith, but signs follow those that believe. And that faith is not to have a perfect knowledge. And I wanted perfect knowledge. I wanted to know for 100% certainty it was true. And even though I feel like these experiences were quite profound, they're quite direct, I felt like I needed it to combat my shelf and all my questions and issues. It still didn't eliminate faith. Because I could still possibly say, maybe these were just coincidences with elevation emotion. I can't know for 100%. That was God. But finally, it came to a point where I had to really weigh up what do I make of these experiences? Do I think it was just coincidence and elevation emotion? Or do I think this was really God speaking to me and answering me? Uh, do I believe I received revelation? And if I believe there's a God, then I have to believe that this was Him speaking to me. I remember I asked myself, like, if I'm a betting man, would I bet my money, my life, my soul? on these experiences being true revelations or just being coincidence or elevation emotion. And that's where I knew that I, I linked towards, I believe, I believe that this was God speaking to me. I believe that this was spirit illuminating and enlightening my mind. And I felt this pull, this call to, to come back to the church. So I remember I, I wrote a letter to my state president, same one that I'd met with before and told him about a lot of these experiences and that I, Decide that I'm going to come back to church. Wow, that is so powerful, so amazing! Oh my gosh. Okay, tell us how it felt to go back to church, and I also want to know about your sister. What happened with that? And yeah, what was the experience like going back? And also, did you publicly post it on Facebook? Like, hey guys, I take back what I said. <laughs> uh, no, so I, I didn't go public on uh, on Facebook again. I sort of realized that you know. I, I kept it quite personal and private somewhat. These experiences, I shared them with a few people. Going back to church is really hard. <laughs> Whenever I, I drove there, there really was this wrestle between his will and my will, between like the spirit and the intellect. Because I remember driving there and just being like, no, I'm not doing that. I like turned around, drove back. And I was like, no, you got to go. And it was like I was fighting with myself there. I remember like walking through the car park and then entering the church doors. I'm like, I can't believe I'm back. Like I thought like, I've graduated from Mormonism and I was like, I have the real truth and you're all blind sheep. And I was like, here I am back. But you know what? Coming back, it felt like coming back to my spiritual home. And I remember it was War Conference that Sunday and there were so many people that just walked me back with love and arms. And it, it really did feel for me like I was back in my spiritual home. So yeah. So awesome. I love that. So my sister was living in England at the time. So she knew that... Um, I came back to church. I think she was surprised because I think she thought I probably just came back for social reasons. I was like, um, no, actually, I believe again. She was like, what? <laughs> you know? And even some of my friends were surprised because whenever I left the church, like I would have told people, like, not that I was trying to like destroy people's faith, but I would have pretty much told them yeah. all the issues I had. So uh, people were, friends were surprised whenever I came back to the church. Uh, and since then, we've, me and my sister, we've maintained a good relationship. She's aware of my channel. She is still, you know, critical of the church, but we've had some, I think, positive conversations where she's listened and 
listen to my story and experiences and I feel like we are able to talk and listen while we might disagree. We don't have to be disagreeable and, and we can be respectful of each other's views and experiences. Wow. I am just amazed at your story right now. I I feel like there is so, so much stuff out there on the internet. And I I feel like once a week, it's like I see a post that's just tearing the church down. And it's just so incredible to see how somebody who had such a deep dive into all of the antagonistic material was able to come back and resolve those issues in a spiritual way. It's like, my mind is blown right now. <laughs> Cause I think if TikTok had been created when I left the church, I probably would have been one of those anti yeah. <laughs> ex Mormon TikTokers that you would have hated. That probably <laughs> would have been me. And yeah. I, I, I really did not, expect to come back a lot of people have said to me you never really left the church you, you still really believed almost like um sometimes what members can say to people when they leave the church oh you never really had a testimony you know that sort of thing you just uh, couldn't hack the commandments people would say that to me like you just couldn't hack being ex Mormon. <laughs> the church was comfortable for you and whether or not the spiritual experiences are real and valid or not they're, they're the reason yeah. i came back primarily some of the things to do with apologetics and evidence. And over the years, I've been trying to reconstruct my faith and my paradigms because I couldn't go back to the very simplistic yeah. black and white view I had of scripture prophets before. Uh, and, and it has been a struggle, like still navigating my way through. You know, there's controversial things in church history. There's so many critical arguments made against different things. And I spent you know, the last couple of years exploring apologetics. I'm still an open-minded mm -hmm. person. So I'm very open-minded to wanting to look at what the critics have to say. And there's been times where my testimony has been really strong, particularly after like strong spiritual experiences. And I've been, you know, going back to the, you know, my temple recommend reading the scriptures, uh, listening to BYU devotionals and conference talks and really getting back to like the strong testimony I had, like as a missionary. But then there's been times where like friends or family members leave where they bring up a lot of criticisms or you encounter podcast or, or something that sort of rattles your faith again there's times where you begin to doubt again and that's sort of been part of my faith journey that it, it's not been all clean mm -hmm. ceiling mm -hmm. since coming back to the church there's been there's been wrestles but there's also been times where i've exercised faith and i've had another spiritual experience and the analogy i give is you've heard, heard the yep. shelf analogy like you have your shelf and i felt like my spiritual experiences was like god giving me a new shelf we didn't remove many books. And over time, my shelf seemed quite heavy. I was like, I think my shelf's going to go. And then after exercising faith, or you find some sort of uh, an apologetic reconciliation, it's like he's put in the screw. Uh, and some of the books with research and with learning more about the context and diving into faithful scholarship, some books have been removed or at least been lighter. But for the most part, it's been, I think, the spiritual experiences that brought me back to the church and what have really been my rock keeping me in. Uh, I don't know if you remember a talk given by Elder Holland. It was about like the Book of Mormon. And for those who are going to leave the church, they have to crawl like over or around or under the mm -hmm. Book of Mormon, leave this church. And I kind of feel the same way about these experiences. Like in order for me to leave, I have to, I don't know what to do with them. I don't know how to deny them. That's sort of been my, my faith journey. And um, that's my amazing. It, it does remind me of, the faith is not blind book talking about how, you know, we start out with the simplistic testimony and then our faith is tried and challenged and we have questions and we encounter podcasts and we encounter YouTube videos and TikTok videos and all the things. And then, you know, we do, we ask for ourselves and we're able to have a mature, more mature, more refined testimony that's like, okay, not everything is perfect, but that's okay because we focus on the primary questions and, you know, the secondary questions we can debate till the end of time. And we may never have the answer to yeah. all of the secondary questions, but the things that we do know is that our spiritual experiences are real. We felt God speak to us and to de deny that would be lying. <laughs> it would be, we would, yeah. we would have to lie about that. And 
I, that's how I feel. And that's kind of what I, what I hear in your story. And it's, it's so incredible. Whenever I, I stepped away from the church and wrote that letter to my bishop at that point, that's where I was at, like spiritually, emotionally, mentally, I left with integrity. And I also came back because of mm-hmm. integrity. I, I felt like if I was being honest with myself, I really believed that uh, this was God yeah. speaking to me. And yeah, it's hard to deny. For sure. Well, you have an amazing story. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for sharing. And everybody listening, check out Mormonism with the Murph. I I really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. It's been awesome. Thank you so much for being a supporter of the Comeback Podcast and listening to our episodes. It would mean so much to us if you would like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps other people be able to find us and we want to share this message to everyone.